This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host. Welcome, everyone. This is the Meaningful Sport Podcast, and I am your host, Nora Ronkainen. Meaningful Sport is a series of discussions on the why and how involvement in sport and physical activity can be an important part of a life worth living. We will also explore threats to meaningful engagement in sport and movement culture practices and ask questions about what we can learn about the human condition through our involvement in sport. The guests are leading scholars in human and social sciences of sport who share their explorations in a scholarly as well as a personal context. If you are interested in the theme, you might also want to check out MeaningfulSport.com. There you can find podcast show notes, read a blog, and access many resources for further explorations of Meaningful Sport. Today's episode is the second part of our discussion on meaningful physical education with doctors Deirdre Nikroinen and Tim Fletcher. In the first part, which I recommend you to check out, we explored the threats to meaningful experience in physical education and the theoretical ideas underpinning our guests' work on meaningful PE. In today's episode, we will learn a lot more about the framework called Learning About Meaningful Physical Education, which our guests have developed. We will hear about the findings and the reception of the project and about the future directions of this pioneering project. Deirdre Nikroinen is a senior lecturer in physical education at Mary Immaculate College in Ireland. And Tim Fletcher is an associate professor in physical education pedagogy in the Department of Kinesiology at Brock University in Canada. I also encourage you to visit the website of their project at meaningfulpe.wordpress.com where you will find a lot more information about the research and the other team members working in the project. I hope you enjoy today's episode. And if I go back to our starting question, so you were mentioning about uh, physical education for being meaningful for some and not so meaningful for others, and you were talking about inclusion and exclusion and now you just briefly mentioned competition and uh, that might be something that is meaningful for those who are succeeding and doing well and and not so meaningful for some others in the class so what are your thoughts on on that element i mean there is a lot of critique about having physical education work in the same logic as, as sport and some would say that uh, that's definitely should not be the case. So what are your thoughts on where does sport fit in PE, if it does at all? Mm, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I suppose when, when we look at approaching PE or, or approaching a, a youth sport setting, I would see that there might be some advantages in the youth sport setting if the children have chosen to be there and they've particularly bought into or chosen voluntarily the activity that's involved. So they all want to join the skiing club and they all would like to learn to ski so that there's a common um, desire or or interest um, in, in the activity. It's a little bit more challenging, I think, in a PE class because the children are actually grouped based on their age rather than on their interests or their physical activity experience. So depending on the country and and how physical education is organized, obviously, they may have no choice at at all. So it's block one of the term, we are all doing cricket. It's block two, we are all doing dance. So they may have no choice of activity. And then in other countries or in other jurisdictions, there may be the option you can do X or Y. But how the the content and, and the activities are decided 
is still, it seems from the literature, very much still teacher decided and teacher directed. So one of the ideas that we're trying to promote is the idea that the children become active agents in what they do and how they do it. Uh, so similar to how maybe the child has said, I would like to learn to ski, I would like to go to the ski club, I would like to, that similarly um, to how maybe their parents have listened to them in selecting their sport activities, somebody, the teacher in the school, is listening to their preferences, their interests, and trying to facilitate them within a group collective, which is a little bit more challenging, but we still think is is more possible it's possible to do much much better than it is at present and we have examples in the research um, for example one good example is Emer Enright's work with Mary O'Sullivan where she worked with a group of uh, girls who were 15 16 17 and were very reluctant participants um, and across a time built that conversation so that they co-created the curriculum. Um, so that's just one example. There are others um, where we've seen that when children are involved in decisions about what they do and how they do it, it gives them more power and more control in shaping the experience in ways that better matches their interests and preferences. And ultimately, works out better for them, uh, for the most part. Similarly, in a sport context, the, the context is already there. So most probably the child is selecting to go to the ski class for the under 12s, which is situated in a ski club which has other members, which has a what Kretschmer calls a movement subculture. So the child learns about something bigger than just skiing by watching the other people arriving with their skis on their cars, listening to conversations, seeing other people skiing. So there's a very strong context for their learning and what they're doing. And sometimes it's more challenging to create that context in a physical education class when you're in a school. Um, so another thing that we would be strongly advocating for is longer units of learning that take the child beyond an introductory beginner level in the gym at the school to make those connections to the physical activity playground outside the physical education class. So at the lunchtime club, after school, in the local community, in the local club, and trying to connect up the physical activity experiences so that what they learn in the physical education class is not something isolated or unconnected. It's, it's part of a bigger physical activity world that they can access. We've been working with uh, a teacher at an international school in Saudi Arabia uh, who's done some fantastic work on um, a cycling unit for students, uh, doing all of those things that, uh, that Deirdre just described, a very long unit. They can choose different entry points uh, within a lesson. They can choose different tasks based on what they would like to do. Um, and... They've established after-school clubs and they're seeing some of those class members connecting with each other to go on a bike ride on the weekend with their families and those sorts of things. So even though that's not a formal sporting context, that captures the idea really nicely of, um, of what Deirdre is describing. I very much like the idea of when you talk about introducing the young person also to the subculture and kind of the life world of that that movement culture, what else is going on there? So it's not just different skills, but kind of immersing yourself to a cultural environment and, and learning the meanings of that, mm. that subculture. Yeah. Yeah, and it's 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 a it's a debate that's constant in, in physical education around the depth and the breadth. So 
how many different activities do you introduce a child to and how deep do you go in each activity? Um, and it's interesting because even among the small group of researchers we've talked about, so Dewitt and Bain would talk about introducing enough different activities for the child to find something that they like. And Kretschmar would say, you have to make choices. You have to pick some that you can go deep enough. So even if this isn't the one that they choose, they'll have gone deep enough in something to appreciate, understand what going deep is and what it feels like. Um, so that tension is always there because in a physical education class, as opposed to a sport context, they haven't all chosen to be there for that one content. So it, the challenge is a little bit more, a little bit more, but I, I still think that it is possible, um, to work towards a, a group consensus, um, in terms of content and, and then how they're going to engage around the activities. Um, Kretschmer has a lovely quote where he says, in a PE context that much of the good stuff of movement remains hidden. So that if you're always doing these little introductory courses, you're probably going to emphasize one or two skills. The more skilled will master them, the less skilled won't have enough time. And suddenly you've moved on to the next thing. And, you know, that good stuff remains hidden from the children and, and they don't get to see it or experience it in ways that draws them in deeper and sucks them in uh, to make it a part of who they are. So Kretcher writes beautifully about moving from being somebody doing dance to someone identifying as a dancer and, or a runner or a swimmer. And what, what is the, the, the tipping point where you become a swimmer or a dancer? And then we move to questions about identity and meaning. And mm -hmm. it seems that having an identity in that movement subculture is probably very closely intertwined with finding meaning in that activity. Mm. Yeah. And it, it, it's not too far away from self-determination either in terms of that feeling of belonging. Um, it, Kretschmar's work would echo some of that as well. Um, so that sense of, and again, social interaction, belonging. So I think we're all talking about the same things um, or very similar ideas um, that certainly don't contradict each other. Um, and I would suggest complement each other more than anything else. Uh, yeah, I, I agree, particularly with Deirdre's last point there that, uh, it, you know, we go back to the conversations about intrinsic motivation and what's the difference and so on and so forth. I don't, we're certainly not uh, positioning our ideas um, in competition with other theories or other ways of looking at things. It's That's just um, our preferred position, I suppose, what's made sense to us. Um, and I think we're trying to see complementarity rather than um, contradictions necessarily. We're all trying to work towards similar things. Maybe we come at it from a different angle and have our own preferences. Um, but it's interesting mm -hmm. as the conversations uh, been going on, you know, I've been thinking to myself, yeah, so that obviously links closely with autonomy, as Deirdre said, that links closely with some of these ideas about self-determination as two ideas or one sort of umbrella idea that, that has a lot of similarity um, to it. Mm. And I think actually, I think it would be important to mention that in how we define meaningfulness, you know, we, we position it as something that happens through uh, looking back and making sense of. So in terms of the work that we're doing, while we've in identified these features of experience, I, I guess if you wanted to say, what are the top pedagogies that we've identified, then goal setting and reflection uh, is top of our, very close to top of the list. So that idea that, and obviously connects closely to motivation theory as well, I know, um, but that it's the reflection on the experience and 
positioning it uh, relative to other experiences in terms of is is useful in terms of identifying preferences oh so i preferred it when it was more competitive than not or i preferred it when i was able to track my own time than someone else imposing one or i preferred it or it worked better for me when the goal i set was um, so goal setting and reflection for us are kind of the bookends of the experience. So it's through goal setting and then reflecting on those goals and in, in kind of a holistic way in terms of how the experience worked or didn't work for the individual. We see as um, being kind of tools of empowerment that obviously the teacher has to allow the conversation to happen, but it's it's the children themselves who identify the meaningfulness or not of the experience. It's the children themselves who qualitatively evaluate the experience and how it could work better for them. And then hopefully based on that, shape the experience and tweak the experience. So they become informed consumers in a way. They know what they like and what they don't like and they're able to articulate it. And the, And based on that, they're able to shape experiences that work and fit for them. And as a consequence of that, it fits better in their lives and maybe it fits there for longer as well. Um, and and from, a, from a teaching perspective uh, and from a learning perspective, there's also value beyond the individual um, making the reflection, like becoming personally aware of what you find meaningful is extremely important. But when those reflections are shared through writing or through discussions, you can learn about what others in your class find meaningful. Maybe then you find someone who has similar interests to you and that becomes a partner that you can um, explore some movements outside of the school um, environment in the local community. Another thing is that you might be able to see through those discussions how you have opportunities that perhaps other people in your class don't for various reasons and collectively you can start advocating for for more experiences in a community. Um, so it becomes quite democratic in that way. And then, of course, the teacher becomes aware of all of the different types of things that the students in the class are finding meaningful, what works for them, what doesn't, and so on. And so as the teacher gets a better sense of what drives the students in that class, they can then make more informed pedagogical decisions based on understanding really quite deeply what, what drives the kids in that, uh, in that particular class and start co-designing experiences based on what they've heard or what they've read um, through those reflections. Yeah. Uh, let's then move on, uh, just cautious of the time. So... I think I would really like to hear about your experience of implementing the framework you have developed. So uh, maybe just to give a brief overview of of what you've done, the practical work, and, and what are your reflections on that so far? Sure. Um, so uh, both Tim and I are teacher educators. So we work with pre-service teachers who are learning to teach physical education. So we, we've developed a framework that you mentioned at the beginning, uh, what we call the LAMP framework, learning about meaningful physical education, which is a set of pedagogical strategies that teacher educators can use working with pre-service teachers. Um, and we started that work maybe six, seven years ago now. So, uh, we're very excited and, um, delighted that other teachers are taking up um, that framework uh, that we call LAMP and using those pedagogical principles in their practices. So we're working directly with some teachers in Ireland, some teacher educators in Ireland, in um, some other contexts to uh, develop those principles for using in, in teacher education programs. Uh, alongside that, we have a second, I suppose, track of research where we've been working with teachers. And this work has been primarily led by Stephanie Benny, the PhD student in um, Canada. It's a large uh, SHRC funded project in Canada across two sites uh, with Doug Leddy in Alberta. Um, 
as well as uh, Steph's work in Ontario. And that work is with practicing teachers and supporting their use of the framework um, across across the school year with their classes. Um, and then we have a third, um, I suppose, smaller thread, which is developing, which is looking specifically at the children's experiences. And we've done some preliminary work looking at the children's experiences uh, in a small pilot that we based in Ireland. Um, and we have um, applied with some partners for an Erasmus Plus grant um, that we hope, uh, an Erasmus Plus board, which we are hoping might develop uh, that work a little bit further. Um, overall, our findings, um, sorry, and we also have that research in early childhood settings and at elementary level um, with some teachers in um, the Middle East. So we, we've got a few different threads going on. Um, and I suppose the first thing to say is the findings of each of the threads is complementing and feeding into the others. Um, but overall, um, there's very strong support for the approach. Um, the children that we worked with in Ireland absolutely loved it. Um, they uh, appreciated um, being included in decision making. They absolutely thrived in the ability to control and make decision makings about their own learning and what it looked like. Um, the teachers appreciate the framework as a structure to help them organize and think and plan. Um, and ultimately, all our findings so far are, I suppose, giving us impetus to develop the project further um, and to inquire more deeply around the pedagogical tools that work in different contexts. So at the moment, uh, we have a PhD, well, she's Doug Lady's PhD student, who is working in a First Nations context in Canada, who's specifically looking um, at how meaningful pedagogies might look different or the same in, in a different context. Um, Tim, do you want to add to that? What have I left out? No, I think uh, I think you've captured it quite nicely, but what we're still very much in the in the hunch phase, I suppose, in working with teachers, like we think these ideas might work uh, and we've been getting some tremendous feedback from them about what they're finding helpful, what their students are finding helpful, what they like, what they don't like, how they like to learn about it uh, compared to other methods and that sort of thing. So as we move into the next probably one to two years and start to analyse those findings and write them up, I think we'll hopefully eventually get to a point where we're able to say, on the whole, these types of things work better than other types of things, and this is what we we are recommending. So we're able to refine things in the next couple of years. Uh, we've been working on some ideas, some preliminary evidence uh, up to this point based on the work that we started six or seven years ago, and I think we're starting to saturate, get those ideas saturated a little bit more as we hear from more teachers in a wider variety of contexts. Uh, we're always very open to taking new directions and uh, particularly based on teachers' experiences and their students' experiences. As we said at the start, we're pedagogues at heart. So when we hear from a teacher that this really worked well or this didn't work well, we take we take that feedback very seriously and, and try to implement it um, in a way that makes sense to to all of us. Yeah, and, and I think it's worth adding that our, at, at the outset, we made a decision that what we were trying to do, that we wanted it to be very accessible to teachers, um, that a teacher could take the ideas and go and, you know, implement or that they'd be flexible enough that the teachers could shape them to work in their own contexts. Um, and um, 
I'm not a Twitter person, but there are a few teachers in different places who liked some of the ideas and took them up and and started trying them out in, in their practice, um, which was great. And, and I suppose one of the outcomes of that is that we had a number of individuals Visual teachers in different places around the world who were using the ideas in in, in their own context, and um, and and that is actually um, hopefully in the next six months going to actually become a, an edited book, um, which is um, a book which includes case studies of different teachers in different contexts using the idea of meaningfulness um, with their students in in their own local schools. Um, so I guess it's an example of how you can write the research paper, but it's actually the blog that becomes somebody's Twitter post that becomes some, the, somebody else's blog that is actually um, a really significant part of our research because, because we emphasize the teacher's experiences of using the framework then the teacher's experiences is so valuable in shaping how we go forward. And that brings the really important message that in addition to writing these research papers, to be sure that the message also gets across with the social media and the other platforms so that it can have an impact on on practice more widely as well. I'm really excited to hear about this edited book and, and I look forward to seeing that hopefully fairly soon. And uh, I think for wrapping up today, um, what would be the kind of take home messages for our listeners today? Or if there are a couple of things from the talk, what would you like uh, the people to remember? Um, one thing, I suppose, um, is that that sense that, you know, in any conversation, a coach or someone involved in sport or physical activity will say, of course, I want the children to have a meaningful experience. Um, and I suppose the, the question for me always is, how do you know what experience they're having? Um, and the value of uh, having those conversations with the athlete or the, the student or the child in terms of the kind of experience they're having, what works for them, Um, and the value of that conversation. Um, so empowering the children and, and I guess fundamentally taking kind of a democratic approach um, to all those relationships. Yeah, I, uh, I guess there are different messages depending on who's listening, if it's a researcher listening or a teacher educator or, or a teacher. I think some of the things that, that I'm coming away with is Probably, as we've said, the uh, the complementarity of the different approaches that are out there, um, and our starting point and our positions are one among many. Um, it's what's worked for us, and we're very grateful that many teachers are finding that work for them as well. Uh, but we're certainly not setting it up in competition to others, and we're very respectful of of these other approaches that have uh, have similarly positive findings uh, from the teacher's perspective I would probably echo what what Deirdre has said uh, really seeing the value in committing to learning more about your students movement histories um, the movement cultures that I that they have access to in their local communities um, and maybe that means making things more accessible um, in local communities. Uh, but I guess, as uh, we discussed earlier, try not to project what we find meaningful in movement as teachers. Of course, we love movement. We wouldn't be choosing the profession that we did if we didn't. But making that commitment to find out from our students what it is that drives them, uh, the reasons why, and then working with The children that we teach to to try to make that uh, more available to more students um, in really positive and enriching ways. Uh, Tim and Deirdre, thank you so much for the talk today. I'm sure there will be a lot 
to reflect on for all of us. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. Thanks so much for having us, Nora. Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Research Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcast or whichever app you use. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show. It would be a great help for us. We have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes, so be sure to tune in. Thank you all for your support and have a great day.